Yeah, forgive me. I'm not used to this platform, so. <laughs> no, you good. Just go ahead and mute yourself, and we'll we'll get get started. We're gonna get started. Good evening. Welcome to another edition of GFB on a Thursday night. Um, glad to have uh, some familiar faces and uh, glad to have some feminine energy in the house tonight. I'm Lisa. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we need more ladies. If you're out there and you're interested, follow the instructions and join the conversation. Um, definitely want to balance in here uh, as much as we can have a balance in here. Uh, and anybody else who's interested, let's let's, you know, Come on in, have a community-oriented conversation, and, and we'll enjoy each other's company for about an hour or so. Um, as always, welcome Brother Mike and uh, Brother Bob and Danya handling the business behind the scenes. Uh, always seen but seldom heard, but we appreciate you being in the house, man, and uh, doing what you do back there. And again, welcome, Lisa. Um, so tonight, uh, just a a, a kind of a broad topic in my opinion and something I, I think we talked about last year sometime. Um, and I believe I titled that show is everything debatable. So this one is everything still debatable. Um, based on the last what year and a half, almost two years now dealing with uh, COVID um, dealing with how it's impacted our lives and, and shifted how we are um, able to socialize and and be around each other and the things that we have forever in our lifetimes taken for granted in terms of um, going out in the public and just feeling uh, safe and sound in terms of breathing, touching one another and things of that nature. Um, there's a there's a couple of options in terms of uh, some sort of protection vaccine that are available but there are a lot of debates uh, still going on at this point in time when variants are occurring in the virus and now I think it's the Delta variant that we're hearing about that's going to set us back um, unless we're proactive because we failed to be proactive the first time um, so the debate that comes out in that realm is often centered around, well, I don't want to take it. And I, I, that's all I need to hear. If you don't want to take the virus, that's that, then leave it there. I'm, I'm fine with just understanding that you don't want to take it. But the reasoning um, sometimes is what derails or creates that uh, is everything still debatable uh, question in my mind, because it seems to be proven that those who have the vaccine, are able to better fight off the uh, harsher effects of the virus and um, in some cases not spread it. Uh, so there's some effectiveness that's been documented. Um, of course, there have been side effects. Nobody's debating that. I understand fears, but there are people who are adamant and they would take medicine and help if they were deathly ill so this is an opportunity to get in front of that thing so that's kind of uh the the, the discussion i'm wanting to have tonight centered around those type of uh conflicting ideas um normalizing somewhat common sense thought versus always finding a a reason to take a counterpoint so the COVID thing again Nobody's at this point making you take anything. I firmly believe that at some point, if the government wants you to have this thing, you're going to get it, whether it's in your water and that soda you like to drink so much or whatever the case is. At some point, they'll figure out how to get it to you if, you know, you're that adamant about not going to get the shot now. Uh, okay, 
that's the general way we're going to function tonight. It's not a lot of questions, not heavily questioned tonight. It is, I'm not, I didn't sit around to, with this one. I just wanted to have an open discussion. I didn't make up a lot of questions, but they'll come naturally, I'm sure. So thinking along the lines of the COVID type uh, thought process, there's also, you know, one of my favorite things to engage in some political uh, activity taking place right now. And I have a, quite a few clips I want to make sure I get to early um, to really uh, frame tonight's discussion specifically around matters that are taking place on Capitol Hill um, involving the testimony of some of the police officers involved in the uh, notorious acts of January 6th of 2021. Um, I'm going to let them uh, tell the tale and then I'll end it off with uh what again sparks this conversation and this question uh is everything up for debate i'll, I'll end it with a brief clip that that kind of solidifies that question so um with that being said i hope everybody's strapped in for the ride there is a rather uh long clip in, in the middle but it's all worth it and it's i think it's valuable to listen to these guys um, and I, I'm fairly certain there's probably going to be some female officers that testify also. But listen to these officers testify about the events that took place uh, at our nation's capital on January 6th. So with uh, that being said, I'm going to now share my screen and play a couple of videos. It, it will definitely go a long way towards framing our conversation tonight. So let's uh, let's get this started. All right. Let me know if something's not right, but here we go. My body camera captured the violence of the crowd direct toward me during those very frightening moments. It's an important part of the record for this committee's investigation, for the country's understanding of how I was assaulted and nearly killed as the mob attacked the Capitol that day. And I hope that everyone will be able to watch it. The portions of the video I've seen remain extremely painful me, for me to watch at times. But it is essential that everyone understands what really happened that tragic day. During those moments, I remember thinking there was a very good chance I would be torn apart or shot to death with my own weapon. I thought of my four daughters who might lose their dad. I remain grateful that no member of Congress had to go through the violent assault that I experienced that day. During the assault, I thought about using my firearm on my attackers, but I knew that if I did, I would be quickly overwhelmed. And that in their minds would provide them with the justification for killing me. So I instead decided to appeal to the, any humanity they might have. I said as loud as I could manage, I've got kids. Thankfully, some in the crowd stepped in and assisted me. Those few individuals protected me from a crowd and inched me toward the Capitol until my fellow officers could rescue me. I was carried back inside. What happened afterwards is much less vivid. I had been beaten unconscious and remained so for more than four minutes. I know that Jimmy helped to evacuate me from the building and drove me to MedStar Washington Hospital Center, despite suffering significant injuries himself. At the hospital, doctors told me that I had suffered a heart attack, and I was later diagnosed with a concussion, a traumatic brain injury, and post-traumatic stress disorder. As my physical injuries gradually subsided and the adrenaline that had stayed with me for weeks waned, I've been left with the psychological trauma and the emotional anxiety of having survived such a horrific event. And my children continue to deal with the trauma of nearly losing their dad that day. What makes the struggle harder and more painful is to know so many of my fellow citizens, including so many of the people I put my life at risk to defend, are downplaying or outright denying what happened. I feel like I went to hell and back to protect them and the people in this room. But too many are now telling me that hell doesn't exist or that hell actually wasn't that bad. 
the indifference shown to my colleagues is disgraceful. My law enforcement career prepared me to cope with some of the aspects of this experience. Being an officer, you know your life is at risk whenever you walk out the door, even if you don't expect otherwise law abiding citizens to take up arms against you. But nothing, truly nothing, has prepared me to address those elected members of our government who continue to deny the events of that day. And in doing so, betray their oath of office. There I saw rioters who had invaded the Capitol carrying a Confederate flag, a red MAGA flag, and a don't tread on me flag. I decided to stand my ground there to prevent any rioters from heading down the stairs to the Lower West Terrace entrance, because that's where officers were getting decontamination aid and were, and were particularly vulnerable. At the top of the stairs, I confronted a group of insurrectionists, warning them do not go back, go down those steps. One of them shouted, keep moving, patriots. Another displayed what looked like a law enforcement badge and told me, we're doing this for you. One of the invaders approached me like he was going to try to get past me and head down the stairs. I hit him, knocking him down. After getting relieved by other officers in the crypt, I took off running upstairs towards the speaker's lobby and helped the plainclothes officer who was getting hassled by insurrectionists. Some of them were dressed like members of a militia group, wearing tactical vests, cargo pants, and body armor. I was physically exhausted and it was hard to breathe and to see because of all the chemical spray in the air. More and more insurrectionists were pouring into the area by the speaker's lobby near the rotunda, some wearing MAGA hats and shirts that said Trump 2020. I told them to just leave the Capitol and in response, they yelled, no, man, this is our house. President Trump invited us here. We're here to stop the steal. Joe Biden is not the president. Nobody voted for Joe Biden. I'm a law enforcement officer, and I do my best to keep politics out of my job. But in this circumstance, I responded, well, I voted for Joe Biden. Does my vote not count? Am I nobody? That prompted a torrent of racial epithets. One woman in a pink MAGA shirt yelled, you hear that guys? This nigger voted for Joe Biden. Then the crowd, perhaps around 20 people, joined in screaming, boo, fucking nigger. No one had ever, ever called me a nigger while wearing the uniform of a Capitol Police officer. In the days following the attempted insurrection, other black officers shared with me their own stories of racial abuse on January 6th. One officer told me he had never, and in his, his entire 40 years of life, been called a nigger to his face, and that streak ended on January 6th. Yet another black officer later told me he had been confronted by insurrectionists in the Capitol who told him, put your gun down and we'll show you what kind of nigger you really are. To be candid, the rest of the afternoon is a blur. But I know I went throughout the Capitol to assist the officers who needed aid and help expel more insurrectionists. In the crypt, I encountered Sergeant Gunnell, who was giving assistance to an unconscious woman who had been in the crowd of rioters on the west side of the Capitol. I helped to carry her to the area of the House Majority Leader's office where she was administered CPR. As the afternoon wore on, I was completely drained, both physically and emotionally, and in shock and total disbelief over what had happened. Once the building was cleared, I went to the rotunda 
to recover with other officers and share our experiences from what happened that afternoon. Representative Rodney Davis was there offering support to officers. And when he and I saw each other, he came over and he gave me a big hug. I sat down on a bench in the rotunda with a friend of mine who was also a black Capitol Police officer and told him about the racial slurs I endured. I became very emotional and began yelling. How the blank could something like this happen? Is this America? I began sobbing. Officers came over to console me. Later on January 6, after order and security had been restored in the Capitol through the hard work and sacrifices, law enforcement members took the floor of the House to speak out about what had happened that day. Among them was House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy, who along with my fellow officers, I had protected that day and will protect today and tomorrow. I had protected that day and will protect today and tomorrow. And the minority leader, to his great credit, said the following to the House, the violence, destruction, and chaos we saw earlier was unacceptable, undemocratic, and un-American. It was the saddest day I've ever had serving in this institution, end quote. Members of the select committee, the minority leader was absolutely right. How he described what took place in the Capitol. And for those of us in the Capitol Police who serve and revere this institution and who love the Capitol building, it was the saddest day for us as well. More than six months later, January 6th still isn't over for me. I've had to avail myself of multiple counseling sessions from the Capitol Police Employee Assistance Program, and I'm now receiving private counseling therapy for the persistent emotional trauma of that day. I've also participated in many peer support programs with fellow law enforcement officers from across, around the United States. I know so many other officers continue to hurt, both physically and emotionally. I want to take this moment to speak to my fellow officers about the emotions they're continuing to experience from the events of January 6. There's absolutely nothing wrong with seeking professional counseling. What we went through that day was traumatic. And if you are hurting, please take advantage of the counseling services that are available to us. I also respectfully ask that this select committee review the available resources, the services available to us and consider whether they are sufficient enough to meet our needs especially with respect to the amount of leave that we are allowed. In closing, we can never again allow democracy to be put in peril, as it was on January 6th. I thank the members of the Select Committee for your commitment to determine what led to disaster at the Capitol on January 6th, what actually took place that day, and what steps should be taken to prevent such an attack on our democracy from ever happening again. I also want to thank and acknowledge my brothers and sisters in blue who fought alongside me on January 6th to protect our democracy. Each of you is a hero and it is my honor to serve with you each and every day. I'd like to thank the American people for all of the support that they have provided these past several months to me and my fellow officers. Lastly, to the rioters, the insurrectionists, and the terrorists of that day. Democracy went on that night and still continues to exist today. Democracy is bigger than any one person and any one party. You all tried to disrupt democracy that day. And you all failed. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify, and I would be happy to answer any questions that you may have. I just have one more and then we'll get to the talking and this is relatively short. Uh, why don't the Democrats want to get to the truth? 
why don't they want to answer the fundamental question, which is why wasn't there a better security posture on that day? Let me just read from a news account from February of this year. Pelosi's office had previously impressed upon the Sergeant of Arms, Paul Irving, that the National Guard was to remain off Capitol grounds. Irving told House administration discussion centered around the, quote, optics. Why were the Democrats so concerned about the optics? Why were they so concerned about how it would look? Because what happened last summer? It's all driven by what happened last summer, where Democrats normalized anarchy, normalized political violence, raised bail money for the very rioters and looters who destroyed small businesses, attacked innocent civilians, and maybe most importantly, attacked police officers. When you spend a year talking about defunding the police and actually defund the police, it's kind of hard to have more police here on January 6th like they should have done. That's the fundamental question. That's why this thing has turned into such a political charade. The police officers who will testify today, and frankly, all Capitol Hill police officers, deserve to have more help that day. But the Democrats couldn't do it because of the political position they had taken all throughout last year. That's the fundamental question that won't be answered. That's why Republicans aren't serving on this committee. Now I want to yield to the ranking member of the House administration, Mr. Davis. All righty. I hope that was not a uh, information overload. I hope everybody Body, huh? so that uh so that uh we could have a, a robust discussion around i guess at this point what's reality and what's not <laughs> what what truly happens versus what spun out of uh political interest and desire for um holding on to power that you're not doing anything with that benefits the citizens the people um, so anyway, uh, I'll just open this up right now because uh, that was a lot to take in, but I'm definitely interested on hearing uh, you guys' thoughts. I know you know what we're framing this around. The last comments that were made by Jim Jordan are like, what the heck is he talking about? He, there's this this yammering to compare some of the uh, protests that took place under the banner of Black Lives Matter um, and that's a whole nother conversation, but it's a yammering to compare those things with January 6th and the, the funding of the police. Come on, man. the false equivalencies are rampant. I don't know where they get this stuff from, who sits in rooms and just connects dots that are on different pages and says, yeah, this, this totally makes sense. But you know what the problem is? It does make sense to some people. So that's the whole, is everything still debatable quest. So anyway, uh, just share your thoughts on 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 thing the things we just watched, and you can take it back to the COVID conversation if you like. But um, Mayor, I'll start with you, man. Just just you know, just spitball it, man. What are your thoughts on all of this, and is everything still debatable? Unfortunately, I think it is um, for a large portion of people, and with the way that people depend on media and um, and have a hard time with like true media literacy. I think we've had this conversation before. There's a, it's a very difficult for people to, to kind of deconstruct the messages that are being shown to them and figure out like, is there a reason that this particular outlet or, or person in my life would slant something and give me a story and the way news cycles work now with, you know, um, the dependency on, on uh, social media and all these other spaces, you can, you can change those narratives. Like you can have something that's on video that shows you exactly what happened, but you can cut it a different way, have somebody say something and put some images in it while you're watching the TV screen that match what the person is saying, whatever narrative they want to spin. And if people don't, you know, if people want to be blissfully ignorant, I mean, I, unfortunately, I think everything is debatable. I mean, you have to like, we, we're in this room right now where we're all looking here and hit, I got this pen and I dropped it. It's there's no disputing that the pen fell, but we'll agree on that because like you know we're sane and and we're you know here and we kind of witnessed it, but we saw it and it's right here, so we can't dispute that now. A week from now, maybe I could spin the story a little bit differently. I don't know. Uh, you know it's just, it's just, this is where we are. 
You know where it goes, Mel. It's, it's, but what happened right before that? Before the video started. So somebody would look at this. We've been on 24 minutes and, or 25 minutes at this point. And they'll say, well, man, we don't know what happened. And then it'd be right before that video started, that pen yep. could have been in his hand the whole time. You know, so it's, mm -hmm. yeah, it's a, it's a, it, I guess everything is still up for debate. Um, <laughs> Uh, Lisa, what what are your thoughts? Uh, I, and Officer Dunn's testimony was was important for me to play in totality, uh, primarily because of my feelings and and my sentiment about Black American life being specifically American. For one thing, nothing others him. He is speaking about his country and his right to vote and his job, which he was made to understand. He was in it, but not of it by a group of people in a place that is supposed to have transcended that uh, that realm. And witnessing a Confederate flag being walked through. Come on, man. That's got to be heartbreaking. Gut wrenching. Go ahead, Lisa. So, um, man, thank you again, Felton. You have the best topics. But I actually paused the camera because I did get so um, emotional. And um, interestingly, I can tie both of those subjects, the COVID and that insurrection together. I got emotional because you can't know what that feels like to have to endure doing a job and feeling the threat of your life being taken just for the color of your skin. Now, I actually traveled by car to Dallas, Texas um, for, eight, for eight days. Um, and I was going to this uh, summit called Celebrate Recovery. And I'm trying to start this ministry for recovering from trauma for people in my circle and things like that. I got there. I've traveled actually through, uh, went through Nashville, stayed overnight in Nashville. And so going from here to Nashville and then to Texas, I'm with my 16 year old daughter and we had to have conversations about driving down this highway and seeing these ginormous, gigantic and enormous Confederate flags and having breaking down these feelings. Now me as a woman and I'm with my daughter thinking, okay, I can't have a flat tire. How would I react? Because I don't know what I will come up against. But for the people who don't bother to put themselves in that position, that's just, inhumane because whether something has happened to me or not, I still have to have that thought process, okay? Going through those hills. And there were times where I had no cell service. So get to celebrate recovery. I had never gone. I'd heard about it from a podcast and I'm just about trying to help society heal people I have some influence with. And I got there and it was at the Potter's house and uh, it was a Rick Warren um, program. It was thousands of people, thousands. And they were 99% white and they were excited. Okay, they've gone through the program and they, yay, we recovered, da, 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 da. You know, can I tell you, I stayed 30 minutes and left. And it, listen, to think number one, nobody was masked. I know I've been vaccinated. My daughter was vaccinated. I'm sitting up. I don't know if anybody heard about distance, whatever, but we're talking about it had to be 5,000 people. Okay. We're celebrating recovery. Okay. That's cool. But I was petrified. I was petrified because of the enormous amount of people and having kind of COVID on my mind. But then, yeah, we're at the Potter's house. But this is 99% white folks. I don't know, like, really, whether it's true or not. My reality is I've always got to be on guard, right? I've always got to think, okay, who might accidentally knock me down just because? I don't care if we're in a church. How many things were done in the name of a church to people that just look like me? So I say all that to say this. I have had issues with staking claim to this country because I don't feel like I am a countryman because I don't have the freedom to experience it freely, right? I can't even travel down the road in total peace and tranquility without feeling nervous. And I know assert my rights 
and I'll have with me my protective mechanisms, okay? But that just still doesn't take away the terror. So I, I, I can only bleed for this black man having to do a job and come up against the audacious people that's gonna be threatening you with language that killed eons of your people and you have to protect them and them and them and them. So. Yeah, that 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 is absolutely the rub. That is a black American life in a nutshell. Um, I just choose to really make sure it's understood that this is all I've ever known and this is what I am going to work inside of. I'm not going to continue to other myself, to reach for some magical place called Wakanda that people for some reason have embraced just out of nowhere because we're just so eager to find safety. This is the black American experience and it is fragile and it does come with uh, terror, fear, um, but there's also achievement and there's also a solidification and a um, standing firm in this and knowing that our experience has brought so many other groups rights and and identity and and an affirmation of americanness that we have yet to fully um be able to grasp but i'm still here for it and i won't be calling wakanda home or uh somewhere that i've never been in africa home i'll be calling america home with all this warts and ugliness and no matter how bad she treats me sometimes i love her so um yeah that's that's that would I, that would be harrowing and i love the uh the compare and contrast of your situation with his um you went somewhere supposedly to find a little joy and connectivity and you felt othered <laughs> which is what happens when you go too far outside of uh your immediate surroundings as a black person in america you're gonna find some places that you may not necessarily feel welcome um bob what are your thoughts on this thing man uh <laughs> feel free to jump on the merry-go-round while it's spinning um first comment is to lisa's comments and um as the white face in these squares um i will i will i will say that i totally get everything you just said lisa i totally get it i respect it i hate it um, I believe it. I understand it. I don't understand it in the same way you do. I understand it more intellectually. I understand it more from a perspective of friendship. I don't understand it viscerally like you do. And so I don't want to pretend that I do because I don't. Um, I can tell you that when I see Trump signs and 2024 signs and whatnot, it makes me kind of nauseous. But I don't fear for my life. Um, I remember driving in North Carolina down a um, two lane North Carolina State Highway a few years ago, and I passed an intersection where there was a Klan rally going on, Confederate flags and the whole nine yards. And again, I, I, I was angry, I was nauseous, I was all of those kinds of things, but I did not fear for my life. I was not worried about me. Um, and, um, so I fully recognize there's that foundational difference. And, you know, if I were in a 5,000 person, uh, gathering and everybody was black, but me, would I be concerned? I really wouldn't be concerned. I, I would, I, I would not be, I would have no concerns. I would not be fearful. I would not feel I could be made to feel unwelcome, but my in my natural starting place would not be feel unwelcome. Uh, my natural starting place would not to be uncomfortable. I could be made to feel that way, but that would not be my starting place is my point. Um, and I've been in those situations. So I can say that in truth um, because I have been in those situations and um, or similar situations. Um, to the to, to the core topic, it, it felt, and you know that I just finished reading White Rage, and 
that book basically, it, it, you know, if you really wanted to sum it up and to just a few little uh, um, um, phrases, it's a book about how we have persistently recast truth, reframed, um, made different arguments, um, created myths, um, only to perpetuate a system that we theoretically legally have done away with time after time after time after time after time, but a system that we have not as a nation had a willingness to really get rid of, but a system that we've been insistent upon recreating and recreating and recreating and recreating using myth, using lies, using the system, using local laws versus federal laws, state laws versus federal laws, um, arguing this angle, arguing that angle, um, demonizing the wrong people, aggrandizing the wrong people. Um, and what, what I see about what we're doing now is simply a contemporary version of that same old thing. And we've just gotten better and better and better at doing it because of media and because of all the tools of communication and because of our growing expertise in data and marketing and analysis and interpretation and really getting down to what people are really thinking, really feeling and figuring out ways that we can really prey upon that and cultivate that and use it to, to our particular advantage and so forth and so forth. And that's what we're doing is everything debatable. It shouldn't be, but it, but it is because it's not about truth. It is because it's just not about truth. And if, if, if somehow we can bring truth back to the table, um, and, and, you know, when we have, like with the George Floyd situation, where we have video that everybody gets to watch for 10 minutes over and over and over and over again, and when we have people who are willing across the nation to pile on against the Minneapolis um, uh, municipality, um, and when we have people willing to contribute their time and expertise to help bring a case to trial where it's dismissed out of, out of hand to begin with, where we have the opportunity to do those things. What that says is it's possible, but it, what it also says is that system's not doing it. That is an exception. That is not the system accomplishing anything. That's an extreme. Look that's what extreme. it had to happen for and, it to and happen. That, and that's all the dominoes lining up just right. Yeah. It is not the system working. It's, it's proof of the system failing. This business of Capitol Hill is outrageous. It is outrageous. If the fella, if that, if that jackass that was in the in the last little clip, you, if they really cared about the truth, if they really believed that the Democrats were doing this and didn't do that because of these reasons and so forth, they would join this committee and use this committee as an opportunity to delve into all of the truth around January sixth. Well, but they, but the, the interesting thing is Jim Jordan was one of the people that Pelosi denied the ability to join the committee. Um, he, he was among a, a few other uh, Republicans because they are notorious for muddying the waters and having an agenda as opposed to being truth seekers, as you just stated. So he is he is one of the more notorious ones because he speaks with so much authority and he right. says things that. Well, why is this and why is that? And the Democrats did. And it's like, man, right. you guys are such great actors. Yeah. But, but she, she denied that specific Republican. She didn't deny Republicans. Oh, no, 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 not at all. And she got two, I think. I think she yeah. got two. And, 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 and so if the Republicans were actually genuine. Yeah. Well, um, if he was, if he was, and, and that means if he's not, then there's others just like him, which is right. what the problem is. 
the 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 officer Dunn was speaking about Kevin McCarthy. Look where he's at now versus where he was then. Exactly. And that, and that, that's exactly where that's exactly what I was thinking as he was talking. Where he yeah. was that day versus where he is now. Complete Amazing. I mean completely, completely yeah. different. And I'll use I'll use a completely I'll use a completely different topic for a second to talk about this topic of tonight's discussion. Christianity. Christianity, the term Christianity has been shanghaied by a, a, a group of right wing, uh, hateful, um, non inclusive, judgmental people to the point that Christianity is viewed today as a hateful, negative, non inclusive, not loving faith. What, 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 how, how did that happen? And, it, and again, it has been that way. It's the, it's interestingly the, enough, it, interestingly enough, and one of my favorite things to unpack in terms of Christianity is the debate over slavery. There's a book I always mention it. It's, it's a short read, but it's so dynamic in terms of presenting these contrasting um, ideas on the defense of slavery and the desire to use religion to uh, dismantle slavery. And it's, it's called a. Uh, the Civil War, the, a theological crisis. It's a, it's a short read. If I can locate it, Bob, I'll definitely let you borrow. But it, it goes back and forth unpacking these ministers that use Christianity in the Bible to defend or uh, condemn slavery. Right, and 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 your your point is your point is taken. And my point is that defending slavery was a mainstream Christian thing back in the time of slavery, most mainstream Christian churches have moved far away from that and far away from a whole other array of um, negative, hateful, wrongful kinds of perspectives. But the right has shanghaied the whole message, the, the larger messaging, and it's perceived and, it, and it's caused the whole the whole church to be perceived in that kind of way when you got that over there, but what is really the truth over here from a scholarship perspective and so forth and so forth. And if you look down that road, you get a completely different picture. Yeah. It is, 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 it, you know, religiosity is a, is a always going to be an interesting uh, topic and role to explore. And you're right. There are multiple uh, lanes to that highway and those who continue to be better at using words and, actions to really stoke the fires amongst people are going to uh, find ways to finagle and deal with the spiritual part uh, a little differently. Mike, I got to get to Mike, Bob. We'll, we'll um, come back around uh, in just a second. Um, great, great conversation tonight. Look, I, I, again, I have more I wanted to discuss and I don't get to do it because we're having such a good conversation. I love it. I appreciate it. Yeah, the done a great job already, man. A fit. It's a hissy fit thing. It's a, I ain't get my way. We're gonna, we're gonna pull a temper tantrum, and that's what this all is—a temper tantrum. Even from the last video, well, the Democrats done this. They didn't want that, and like you said, he just know how to put words together, and and, and that's the problem with a lot of these politics things. People can put some words together and have people, but they're wine and dining, rock you to sleep, and that's what's going on. That's what he's saying. Put some words together, trying to make the Democrats look like this type of bad person. As you stated, she did not want him in there because he's the type of person. He can brainwash the system. Go back to um, what the man was stating in the second video, the officer, the um, Capitol Police. All, all I think about is your first amendment. It's not uh, when he, uh, no, going back to the last guy, he talked about the protesters in the Black Lives Matter. It's not protesters. I want to correct something. These are people exercising their First Amendment rights to voice their opinions, how they feel about the injustice in the system. Protesting is something totally different. Yeah, you can call it rallying and protesting, but it's not protesting. We're only exercising our First Amendment rights. 
you know, when I think about my peoples out of Graham, on October 31st, we was they was pepper sprayed. I wasn't there at that time for going to the polls to exercise their Fifth Amendment rights to vote. We were just galvanizing people together to go vote. I was there on the 30th with um, George Floyd's niece and George Floyd's nephew. We was we was walking to the polls to get people to go vote to exercise their Fifth Amendment rights, and that's all we want to do. And that's all we're asking others to do. And that's all we've been doing, but it's a problem. All right, but when we do these things, it's a problem when we when we are um people are starting to be woke. They don't like that, and that's that's why they get mad. If that was Black Lives Matter movement, the BLM, whatever type of movement you want to call it, blacks and to white allies, it would have not have turned out like it did that day on January 6th. Those that's watching it, those that's in these squares know it wouldn't have been, please go home. It'd have been, I'ma shoot. Or go home and it been shooting. We already know that. People ain't got to agree with me, but I know that when I've been, I'm a, I'm an organizer. I'm an activist. I beat the streets all the time. I'm going into Lexington tomorrow. Preparing may get locked up. I don't know. But I'm saying to say that is that, like she stated earlier, why do I have to go? Why do you go somewhere and have to feel uncomfortable? It shouldn't be like that. It shouldn't. I, if I go here, this might happen. It shouldn't be like that. But the system has made these people feel like. They are titled to these things. As you stated earlier, these Trump 2020 side. Trump was a, a person that gave it, this community some power, made these people feel more than they are, you know, and they was following this guy and following his nonsense, and they he brainwashed a lot of people. Uh, we talk about the Confederate flag. She stated she was riding through Tennessee. We see this so much in Graham. Uh, they, they fly proudly up, but they meet us. When we come down there to organize, 30, 40 deep. We came in one day, they were probably 100 deep out there. Um, they fly that, prayer, that flag proudly. But I don't think we should allow that to put fear in us. I think that should allow us to just look at them like they ain't got no sense. They don't know what they're doing. <laughs> That's what we should allow. To look at them like you're crazy. And, you know, and then to hear, you know, the guys talk about, you know, how the guy, the lad, that the first police officer was attacked with and was beat up and done all these things to by his own people and show you what type of system we're dealing with man they don't care about nobody all they care about is that trump was about to lose that people was voting people were exercising their fifth amendment rights and getting out to vote and they didn't like that you know they didn't like that the, 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 the world is changing and the world is changing and, and, and my thing is though the, for the world to keep to continue to change though we gotta stop voting color we gotta vote resumes let me say that yes. again. We got to start voting color and we got to vote resume. I'm saying that for the yes. black people. I want to say it three times so you can hear me. Stop voting color and vote resume. All right? Know what is, if Bob's resume, vote Bob. If Felton's resume is better, vote Felton. If Ms. Lisa's resume is better, vote Ms. Lisa. Not because they're black or white, but because their yes. resume is better. So let me get yes. that out there. Let's make this place a better place and we can get changed. Yeah, my one of my main observances and heavy comments of this past election was my vote is to be earned, not expected. Um, we can't continue to go down this road of uh, we're supposed to vote for this person just because. Um, no, you, you really need to make sure your interests are being met. And uh, black Americans have long suffered from being taken for granted and uh, not really getting anything for their vote. And uh, I think that showed uh, way more in this election than ever before. So we take that knowledge and move forward with it. Uh, I agree with you, Mike. We have to get ready to wrap this up. I have uh, something I need to take care of. I wanna make sure I go around the room, just make your comments concise um, to your point that you wanna wrap up on and leave people hanging with. Bob, I know you have more to state, so I'm gonna come to you and at least I'm gonna say the best for last. So Bob, um, give us a quick uh, synopsis of what you uh, wanted to make sure you left us, left us with this evening. Only that, only that this, the dynamic that we're talking about tonight plays in every aspect of our culture and the, the, um, civil justice realm is, I would argue the most important realm, but it's an aspect of our culture that we have to deal with in literally everything that we do. And, you know, again, 
it's unless we are intentional, unless we stay on top of it, unless we pay attention to it, unless we call it out every time we have the opportunity to call it out, unless we work in favor of accountability and truth, we have to actively, we have to all actively work in favor of truth and accountability. And that's the only thing that will move this tide in the right direction in my opinion. Absolutely. Um, I think shame is, shame is ineffective these days. We have to work towards getting proper representation that actually reflects our values, what we're about as a, as a United States of America and not as uh, this person gets a job and just keeps it for 40 years and doesn't do much with it. But hey, he's he's this known politician. Forget that. We, we can't we can't depend on shame or being effectual anymore. Um, Mike, go ahead. Give us a quick synopsis, your last thoughts and, and, and uh, what you want to leave people with. Uh, the people united can never be defeated. We must continue to unite together. Uh, we must continue to fight together, not fight against each other. Uh, we are much stronger together. Um, that's why they don't like us together. Uh, COVID, I, I would talk about COVID now. COVID tried to depart us in the, in, the, in the world and society and keep us separated six feet apart and do all these things. But I think COVID really brought us together too, though, uh, that we, especially uh, thanks to this right here, our uh, platform of Brother Felton holds and everybody in these squares because we can't get together, but we can get on the screen and, and sharpen each other and bridge this gap of hate and envy and jealousy and confusion and nonsense. You know, it's nonsense, man. It's like the 2021 and we're dealing with this. I, I don't like this and I don't like that. And that, that never go away like fully, but we can make some progress to change and progress to a better com community in that neighborhood. So. The people of United can never be defeated. Thank everybody in the square, Brother Felton. Appreciate you for uh, these topics um, and discussions because I know it happened to one person. That's all that matters. And the coolest man in the room, man, Donye, thank you, man. <laughs> hey, man, appreciate you too, Mike. Look, um, more than anything, uh, we can do better together, as you stated, and progress is what we're all about. We got to leave this place better than we found it, and I think um, we're, we're part of that, that process right now. Lisa, take us home. We go. We gonna we gonna wrap up with you. Give us a, a quick synopsis of, of your what you want people to, to leave here tonight, knowing uh, what you're sharing. Um, my final thought is this: um, everyone has such great points, but we have to be together. But to think about the entitlement, because I finished the book cast, and my biggest takeaway was the United States of America is supposed to be the greatest nation on earth, yet we still allow the banner of hate, torture, terror to have its freedom here. But if you go to Germany, there are no memorials for the Nazis. There are memorials for the Jews. There are people who actually are putting in energy for the lost. And yet well, 6 million Jews, around 6 million Jews that were killed but we were literally stolen from a place. And there is not any memorials to that, but we have memorials to all of the people and the hatred surrounding just the color of a person's skin. So we are all flesh and blood, born of a woman, gonna die and turn into dust. And I believe just like you guys, if we are all together, we are so much stronger. So my, my question is this, what is the problem? Why would you hate someone just for their opinion or their color? What are you afraid of? That has been a thing that has been normalized and a lot of uh, profits and exploitative uh, gains have been made from it, Lisa. And that is a good conversation and topic for another time. I will make note of that. And uh, when I have that, when you have to be here, because that was your question. Appreciate you all. Thank you all for, for showing and, and shaking and proving because uh, I can't do any of this without you. Um, take care. Have a wonderful evening and uh, enjoy your weekend because it's coming. Uh, take care. Right. Thanks, Lisa. Have a good one. Y'all have a good one. All right. Oh, yeah, have a good one.